as well. My name is Pastor Quentin Falconer. I'm the pastor at Cornerstone here, well, one of them. And uh, we just want to thank you for coming today. The Lord's given us a wonderful day for a lecture. Nobody wants to be outside, so we're, we're tucked in here, nice and cozy. And we also have uh, just a couple items of business as we begin here. You should have hit the registration table on your way in. And maybe you have picked up our schedule for the day to keep you on track so you know what to expect. Uh, restrooms are men's rooms over here, the women's rooms in the, in the lobby over there. Uh, there's lots of soap and water, so you can stay clean and virus-free. I don't think we have any uh, worry here yet, but uh, just if you're concerned, soap and water is best. 30 seconds. Um, <laughs> You see on the schedule, it's up here as well, we're going to have two lectures pretty much back to back. We'll have a quick stretch break in the middle of those, but just so you know, in the, in the beginning here, we're in for a, a good stretch. And then after that, we'll have our morning break where you can have some treats and snacks and s walk around a little bit. And then, uh, then we'll have a longer break for lunch after our third session. So uh, if you've dropped your children off, I uh, hope you've connected with our child care facilitator. You know where your kids are in the rooms in the, the gray building next door. If you have questions, feel free to grab me or, or Johanna. We appreciate our volunteers and our, our coordinator. We have our book table, uh, manned by Brian and Jennifer from Evangel. We're, we're grateful for them coming today and hopefully you'll find some good reading materials some follow-up or some other areas of interest in your Christian and devotional life. At the end of the session, we're going to have a, a question and answer time. On the, on the table in the registration, you should have seen a basket with some 3 by 5 cards. Feel free to grab some of those, jot down your questions, especially as they pertain to today's lectures, and uh, we'll have a moderated question and answer time uh, at the end of the day. Well, with that, I want to open in prayer and then uh, introduce our speaker. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for this opportunity that we have as brothers and sisters in Christ to dig into your word, to think about how Jesus taught in parables, uh, what he communicates, and what we should learn as we, as we read these, these stories that he has told. We pray that we might see Jesus more clearly through them, that we might understand more significantly his call on our lives, that we might respond as true disciples in faith. We pray for Dr. Fleur as he presents today, as he teaches and proclaims your word, that you would bless him with strength and energy, and that we, as we sit and as we soak in your word, that we would listen attentively and, and humbly and, and see with eyes to see the words and the truths uh, that you have told us in your word. Father, we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Well, this, uh, this spring we have a, a new speaker, um, Dr. Gabe Fleur, is that right? Like Fleur de Lis, I think that's how you, so if you're wondering how to pronounce that, it's a unique name, uh, but we're delighted to have Dr. Fleur with us. Uh, Gabe is the Associate Minister of Discipleship at First Presbyterian Church in Columbia, South Carolina. Last year we had Derek Thomas out, uh, Gabe is his evening preacher, I say, yeah, and so uh, a, a wonderful background, uh, theologically, academically, but also as a, as a brother in the Lord, uh, a wonderful example of how God called him out of darkness uh, into his marvelous light and has set him on this path of declaring his excellencies, uh, even to those who are still in darkness and encouraging those of us who are walking in the light of Christ. Let's welcome Dr. Fleur. Thank you, dear Thanks brother. So Good morning. Good to see you all. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm not from here. Um, and uh, I will say this. This is my first visit to Southern Oregon. And I love it. Love the scenery. Love God's glory on full display. And it feels just like home. Hospitality has been phenomenal. This is a welcoming, welcoming place, and I'm so grateful for all the kindness that has already been shown me in my short time here. I want to start this morning talking about the gospel from the ground up, and if you have a Bible, please turn with me to Mark chapter 4. 
If you're using one of the Pew Bibles, you'll find this on page 839, 839. And we're going we're gonna to look at kind of the gateway to the parables here from the Gospel of Mark. And that'll be Mark 4, and we'll read verses 1 through 20, but we'll be studying verses 10 through 20 more specifically. And as you're turning there, and before we hear God's Word, let's pray together. God in heaven, how thankful we are to come on a chilly day, but on a day that you have made, and so we will rejoice and be glad in it. We're about to hear words from your mouth, Lord, that might be hard for us, that you tell us that the parables conceal and reveal, and so we would ask here this morning that all of us would be those who have ears to hear and eyes to see, and only you can do that, and so we ask for the Spirit to make Jesus beautiful and believable in all that we hear this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Mark chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. Again he began to teach beside the sea, and a very large crowd gathered about him, so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea, and the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables. And in his teaching he said to them, Listen, Behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground, where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up, since it had no depths of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no gain. And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. And he said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. And he said to them, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but For those outside, everything is in parables, so that they may indeed see, but not perceive, and may indeed hear, but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. And he said to them, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word, and these are the ones along the path where the word is sown when they hear Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground, the ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then, when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are the ones sown among thorns. These are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. But those that were sown on the good soil are those, are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit thirtyfold, sixtyfold, and a hundredfold. Truly the grass withers and the flowers fall away, but the word of the living God will stand forever. Endeavor. Amen. Many of us, I think, are probably familiar with the sermon uh, by Jonathan Edwards, kind of recognized as the last of the Puritans. And it's really, surprisingly, I think, even in a secular age, it's still studied in like high school literature classes where you've got to read what these angry Puritans used to be like. And the sermon that's always trotted out as kind of the picture of the dour Puritans, hellfire and brimstone is Edward sinners in the hands of an angry God. And let me just say, if that's your impression of Jonathan Edwards, it's an, it's an amazingly biblical sermon, first of all. But second of all, that is not like Edwards' theme in all his preaching. That's how it's often painted. Uh, if you want to read something by Jonathan Edwards, let me suggest his sermons on 1 Corinthians 13. Uh, and the same guy who preached sinners in the hands of an angry God also preached a sermon called Heaven as a World of Love. So don't be put off the scent by, by the trail that, that says this is all Jonathan Edwards was. But my point in bringing that up is he actually preached that sermon twice. He preached it first to his 
congregation in Enfield, Connecticut. I'm sorry, in Northampton, Connecticut. Uh, Two weeks prior to that fateful day of Wednesday, July 8th, 1741, when he preached it in Enfield, Connecticut. And if you've ever read an account of what happened when Edward preached it, Edwards preached it the second time, people were falling out in the aisles, rolling on the floor, howling. And, and again, sometimes this sermon is dramatized as Edwards in this robe like thundering from the pulpit. And, and in actual fact, the scene was described like this. He stood up, he wrote out every word of his sermons. He held a candle up and read it like this in a rather high-pitched voice almost monotonous, not this, you know, charismatic delivery. And God worked through it and began what we now recognize as really the second great awakening in American history through this sermon. And here's the point. There's one sermon and two different results. When he preached it to his congregation, nobody did anything. This was the congregation that would ultimately end up firing Jonathan Edwards. And those are kind of the things you do not want to be known for in church history. You know, you don't, you don't want to be the person who at Sun Records said, who is going to listen to a group of four floppy-haired guys from Britain? We don't need to sign them. It's the same thing. You don't want to be known as the congregation that fired Jonathan Edwards. So when he first preached it to them, they walked out, nothing happened. The second time around, the second great awakening begins. Two different results, one sermon. And what that illustrates is exactly what Jesus tells us about here this morning from the parable of the sower and the soils. He wants to plow through our hearts in what he tells us this morning. Now as we jump in, let me set the context more generally for where we're going in these sessions, and then also the context more specifically here for the Gospel of Mark. It's the shortest of the four Gospels, probably the earliest, probably written by Mark taking an eyewitness firsthand account from Peter. How do we know that? If you read through Mark, there's expressions that are used in Mark in the original that are really, the only other place we see them are Peter's sermons, uh, Peter's sermon at Pentecost. So there's just this kind of neat intertextual relationship here that leads us to believe that Mark is taking down Peter's eyewitness account. It's a gospel that moves fast. As, as one friend of mine put it, think about it like this. Like when you go on vacation, you, you flip out your phone and you're showing snapshots of everywhere you've been. That's what Mark is doing here with Jesus' life. You've got a very detailed account in Matthew's gospel. John's gospel spends the last, almost half of it on the last night before Jesus' death. Mark, just one thing after another, his favorite word is immediately. You'll just see that over and over again in Mark's gospel. And really, the, the main theme of this gospel is how, who Jesus is, what he came to do, and what it means to follow him. It's really the gospel of discipleship, if we could put it like that. All of them are about discipleship, but this one in particular focuses on the disciples and, and their role and how he grows them and what it means to follow this Savior that has come into the world as the eternal Son of God. Now, when we get to the parables here, here's, here's a couple things about them. First, they're, they're earthly stories that either reveal or conceal to their hearers heavenly meanings. That's what he's up to. They're earthly stories, so they're everyday illustrations. That's one of the things that should amaze us about Jesus's teaching. He connected with everyday people. He was not an elitist. He was not an intellectualist. He uses, a, a, for example, what we're studying here this morning. Everybody had seen farmers do this. Everybody had been around it, and I was thinking as I was driving over here, where, where I am, you know, you'll, see, you'll still see a lot of cotton fields right outside of Columbia, and you'll still see a lot of that kind of agriculture, but you'd never see a pear orchard in Columbia. That, but if I were to give you an illustration about pear orchards, that would immediately connect with you and not with our congregation in Columbia. Most of them haven't seen the pear orchard. And, and so what Jesus is doing here is using well-worn earthly examples that either reveal or conceal the heavenly meaning. And so, as I mentioned, this parable serves as a kind of gateway into the other parables. And here's what I want us to see by God's grace in two headings this morning. In verses 10 and 12, I want us to see the sovereignty of God in revealing truth. The sovereignty of God in revealing truth. And then in verses 13 to 20, the responsibility of man 
in responding to truth. So the sovereignty of God in revealing the truth and the responsibility of man in responding to truth. Look there again at verses 10 and 12. And when he was alone, those around him with the 12 asked him about the parables. And he said to them, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything is in parables, so that they may indeed see but not perceive, and may indeed hear but not understand, unless they should turn and be forgiven. Notice how, how this, this scene begins to play out. Jesus tells the story, and then he's alone with the twelve. And remember, he's training them, and they are the most unlikely group to change the world. They are everything from a revolutionary kind of what we might call a modern-day Marxist zealot. That's what it means when Simon was a zealot. He was the revolutionary guy. Two fishermen, not the best and the brightest, not the Harvard graduates. This ragtag group of 12 men, and Jesus is bringing them along, and it's just amazing to walk with him as he does that. And it's how he is going to do with everybody who follows him. He is patient with us as his disciples. If you are one of his disciples, he brings us along. And yet, at the same time, he's going to rebuke them here for their hard-heartedness. So they get alone with him, and he, they ask him about the parables. What, what are you talking about? Soils and sowers and all this stuff. And he says this, to you has been given. That is an astonishing way to begin an answer. He, he looks at them and says, this is not for everybody. This is for you, first and foremost. You 12 disciples, you asking me these questions. Now, notice who's not here. The people we would expect to be. The religious leaders. The people who spent all their time studying the Word of God, which at that point consisted of the Old Testament. Roughly 27 books in the Hebrew canon at the time, 39 books in our Old Testament today. Same books they had back then are the ones we use now. And, and it's really difficult to overstate how seriously they took the Bible. This was not a culture that had been affected by skepticism like we have today, where nobody reads the Bibles anymore. There, it, you meet people, especially you know, in the red state of South Carolina, everybody goes to church. You know, there are churches on every corner. I know it's a little bit different out here, but even in that society that we're, that we're in today, you know, where I come from, everybody kind of has some little understanding of the Bible. In, in, in Jesus' time, the religious leaders, that's what they did. Eight to ten hours a day was read the Bible and study it. And they're not here. And that's fascinating that Jesus says, to you has been given. So he's, he's making a subtle point here. He's saying, those who look like insiders are actually outsiders. And those who seem like outsiders can actually become insiders to Jesus' inner circle. It's available for everybody. That's what he's saying. And here's the beauty of grace right at the outset. He, he's giving this to, as I mentioned, 12 unlikely men. And the beauty of grace tells us here that fishermen can become insiders. Those whom the world overlooks can become, as it were, insiders. And those who seem to be the ones that should get it the most are left out. And here's what the gospel tells us. Only those who see their need for wisdom will get in Jesus' inner circle. Only those who see, I don't have it all together. I do not understand. I don't know what I'm doing with my life. I don't know how to get all this right. I don't know how to fix it. And I don't have the resources to fix it. Those are the kind of people that Jesus says, welcome to. These are who I'm revealing myself to. So knowing Jesus involves more than just knowing about him. There are plenty of people in hell who know about Jesus. It's not just knowing about him, he's telling us. It's knowing him. And that's how he's going to reveal himself. And he tells us in these terms, it's given to you by God. It's a sheer gift of grace. It's not by your own works. It's not by working up your own spiritual feelings. It's not because you were more spiritually inclined that I'm giving this to you. It's simply because it's to you. Not because of what you've done, but because of who I am. To you has been given. 
Friends, there is maybe no greater text in Jesus' teaching to teach us about the sovereignty of God's election than these few little words right here. To you has been given. We would, we would want him to in our flesh say, well, Jesus, didn't you come to reveal yourself to everybody? And in one sense, he says, no. I've told stories, he says, purposefully to conceal the truth to some people. Because I am sovereign about who comes, not you, not me. So that's where we come to this little quotation from Isaiah chapter 6. And this is an admittedly difficult teaching, friends. Because it's easy to talk about the part of where, you know, those who are outside get welcome to be insiders. Here's the hard part. He says, when I speak these parables, when I teach, some people are going to be further hardened in their unbelief. And oh, by the way, that's not just me. That started 750 years before I was born in the southern kingdom. When Isaiah is preaching to the people and he's commissioned by God, we'll study that Sunday morning, he's commissioned by God, and at the end of that commissioning, he says, go to the house of Israel and preach, and they may see and believe, or they may not see and not hear, lest they turn to me and be healed. Both cases, one truth. God does the saving. God does the choosing. Friends, that's Christianity 101. This is what sets biblical Christianity apart from every other worldview. I, I'm, without exception, even Christianities that claim to be Christian fail to teach this point. Without exception, in their official documents, I'm thinking of Eastern Orthodoxy, Roman Catholicism. And I'm not trying to get on a rant here. I'm just telling you what is taught there. Not this. Not that God says, here's my parables through my son, and they will draw some people in and harden others. That's Jesus' point. And it holds true for the world in general. Jesus says he passes by some. Now, one scholar put it like this. Think of the parables like the pillar of fire in the Exodus for Israel. Do you remember that story in the book of Exodus when the, God sends the pillar of fire, which I think is the Holy Spirit? It's a pillar of cloud by day, pillar of fire by night, and it provides light for the Israelites and darkness for the Egyptians. In the same way, the parables provide light for those whom God has chosen and darkness for those whom he has passed by. And see, here's, here's what it means for you and for me. If we in our own pride and selfishness and flesh say, I don't need Jesus. I am not going to be duped. I am not one of those people who believes in sin. We know that science has done away with all of that. That's not for me. Then you have just shown what kind of a hearer you are, if that's your attitude. And Jesus does this all the time, not to be mean, but to show you the state of your soul. If that's where you are with Jesus, you're not his. And I say that in love. But he says to us, if when you encounter the word of God, when you encounter this kind of teaching, you go, tell me more. I want more of this. I want to know who you are, Jesus. He says, I will show you me. I will, I will come and take up residence with you, as it were. But the, one of the points I want us to grasp before we move to our second point here is this. The only thing that's fair for sinners like us is wrath. That is so elemental and so basic to the gospel that I would suggest I'm not sure you will ever understand the grace of God until you start with that. So when we hear him say, like, to you has been given, and there's this sovereignty and grace, and that offends us, then let me just say that I, most of the time in my pastoral experience, that's because we're really proud people. And, the, and when we start talking about fairness, that's a really American way to think about things. And fairness in some settings is absolutely right on. That's what we need. But in, when it comes to our eternal destiny, none of us wants what's fair, I promise you. The only thing that's fair for sinners like us is everlasting wrath and judgment from God. And that's got to come home to you if you want any of this to make sense. You've got to start from the position that the only thing I deserve is God's displeasure. 
I have lived for myself. I have forgotten him. I want to be about me. It's all about me. Even if I don't come across as a super selfish person, that's who I am internally. That's where you've got to start if you want grace to make any sense to you. And so the wonder of grace that Jesus brings to us right here at the outset is not a question that should tear us up, which normally we ask this way. Why doesn't God save everybody? The wonder of grace, rather, is the question, why did he save anybody? Not why didn't he save everybody, it's why did he save anybody? Why do we get to believe? What in the world made you get out of bed and come to a conference on the parables on a Saturday morning? Grace, God's choice, before your choice. That's what Jesus is saying here. Now, in the second place, he tells us there's responsibility for man in responding to truth. Let's look there again at verses 13 to 20. And he said to them, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. And these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. First soul. There's responsibility for us here in responding to this truth, and Jesus illustrates that by way of these four soils. First soil, hard soil. I was up in uh, Asheville uh, about a week ago with some brothers that were in a pastor's collective there in Columbia, and we were, were hiking along this path. And we, we, we didn't quite know the way where we were going, and we came to a fork in the road, and there was kind of what looked like a trail off to the side with some branches growing over it. Then in front of us was a path that had obviously been well-worn. So we knew which way to go. And the well-worn path that, you, that, that we saw was packed. It was, it was something where if you had dropped an, an acorn or something like that, it bounced right off. That's the kind of soil Jesus has in mind right here. And this is not so much a hard heart as it is a careless heart. It's a heart that that the person who understands the gospel but hardens himself to the reality of it. He's under the power of Satan and doesn't even realize this. Let me, let me try to bring it more concretely. Maybe that's you. Maybe you come and hear the Bible. Maybe you read Christian literature and listen to Christian radio, but it has no impact on your life. Maybe that's you, if you're, especially if you're a student. Maybe you've grown up around these things. Maybe you've grown up in a church. And you've never come to Christ. And every sermon you hear just seems more boring than the last one. And every time you, you don't pick up the Bible, you don't read it, you don't listen to any kind of Christian teaching. And if you do, it does nothing for your heart. That's a good indicator you're this first soil. That Satan is just snatching the word away. I don't want that to be anybody here today. So take heed if that is you. Then look in the second place what he tells us about the other soul. And then he says in verse 16, And these are the ones sown on the rocky ground, the ones who when they hear the word immediately receive it with joy. And they have no root in themselves but endure for a while. Then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. So here's soul number two, temporary faith. And this represents the people who have a, a temporary, shallow faith in Jesus. They hear the gospel. They respond. They start walking with the Lord. They're on fire for Jesus. But then they succumb to the pressures of life in a fallen world. Then it's how he puts it. Tribulations. Don't just think of like big ticket disasters with this word. Don't think like... They succumb because they get a cancer diagnosis and go, where is God? That's part of it. But what Jesus, I think, has more in mind here is the, the daily disappointments we all face from life in a fallen world. And, and let, me, let me hone in on that. If you don't understand what God is doing in the world, and if you don't understand the basic shape of the gospel, which we're going to come to over and over again, that when you come to Jesus, you take up a cross and you enter into the fellowship of his sufferings. If you don't understand that, life will crush you. This is why paganism, in one sense, is so right in its assessment of life apart from Christ when you know, paganism says life stinks and then you die. That is absolutely right on, 
if, if the gospel isn't true. And we see that increasingly in our culture around us here in America, don't we? Where people are just hopeless. And why are they hopeless? Because life is really hard. And it's not usually the big ticket items that cause us to question God's existence, but the daily irritation of, of a boss who's nasty, or coworkers who are ugly, or students who pick on us, or fellow family members who just are irritants in our lives all the time. And by the way, we are that in somebody else's life, so don't be proud. <laughs> but it's those kind of things. It's, okay, great, there's too much month at the end of the money again. There's all these kind of daily pressures, and that's what Jesus is talking about here. People receive it with joy, then all of a sudden life hits. And because they have no real root and no real understanding of what the gospel entails, they go, this isn't for me, and as one scholar put it, I didn't sign up for this. And then he talks about persecutions can also cause this type of hero to fall away. That will continue to happen to us. And let's just be as blunt as we can. The Christian teaching on human sexuality will bring persecution in the coming years. That will be the place. If we continually say over and over again, as we must, if we love people and we believe what Jesus says about things like heaven and hell and eternity and what's at stake, if we love people, we're going to have to say over and over again, one man, one woman, for life, no pornography, no homosexual activity, no fornication. That's a word we need to recover. Illicit sex outside of marriage of any kind. None of that. The minute you start saying that, people will look at you like you're crazy. And will say, do you really believe all that? And notice how the narrative shifted in the past few years. It's no longer that that's just false. It's dangerous now. You are a threat to the state if you believe that. And by the way, friends, it wasn't any different in the first century. The pagans who martyred Peter and Paul and the, the Romans and the pagans and the Jews who killed Jesus, the Jewish leadership, all had similar views about these things. They would say, not the Jewish people so much, but the Romans and the pagans around were all just saying, no, we're the right way. And if you, don't, if you don't get in line with the state, you are an enemy and you are dangerous. Persecutions will come. And that's when we'll find out what we really believe. It's easy to follow Jesus when the sun is shine, shining. It's a whole lot more difficult when you can't see in the dark. And that's what Jesus warns us about here. And then the, the third soil here, he says, is this. And others are the ones sown among the thorns, verse 18. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. So one of the things that always strikes me when I read these and when I, I study Jesus' words is how contemporary they are. Do you see how much human nature hasn't changed in 2,000 years since Jesus spoke these words? We're still afraid of being ashamed. We're still afraid of persecution. We still have a hard time with the daily trials of life. And we still love money and comfort and security more than we love Jesus. We're still tempted in that direction. Even 2,000 years ago, vacations and status and zip code mattered. And it was a temptation to say, I love these more than Jesus. And he says, that's what the thorns are. In other words, he puts it like this. The word can get choked out by everyday life or by spectacular, mund mundane life. It can get choked out by everyday life, trials and tribulations. Or it can get choked out by if God has blessed you with plenty and you go, this is great. Who needs God? How many times do we encounter that in our prosperous society? What do you mean I'm needy? I don't need anything. I'm good to go. Health insurance, healthy, feeling good. Cars, houses, whatever it is. The deceitfulness of riches. You see, here's how the Bible looks at wealth. Wealth is not bad. Can we just say that? No. Jesus was never a socialist. Nothing, nothing in the New Testament suggests anything like that. 
That is a mistaken interpretation of Acts 2, of Jesus' entire ministry. Don't buy it. Like, how do we know that? Because Jesus was an Old Testament Jewish guy who says things like, go obey the law of Moses. And what does the law of Moses have for us? The eighth commandment, which says, keep private property. Don't steal it. Okay, so God is very pro-private property. That being said, here's the Bible's view of wealth. Never forget where it comes from. Never think your diligence or your hand got it. They did in one sense. God uses means. But everything you and I have this morning from our breath to our clothes is all from him. And he is going to, there's going to be an unequal distribution of resources throughout human history. Promise of God. He tells us that. That's why he's got things in his law about saying, don't treat a poor man one way and a rich man a different way. Treat them both the same because they both come from the hand of God. And oh, by the way, Jesus says, love the poor. Serve them. If you've been given much, much will be required of you. But he's not saying here, riches are bad. Rich people are bad. Get rid of the one percenters. Never going to be found in Jesus' teaching. What he does say is, here's what wealth can do. It can trick you. It can make you think that this life is all there is. And you will begin to hear the word, and the deceitfulness of wealth will be preaching another gospel to you, which is no gospel at all. It will say, take your fill, enjoy your life, don't worry about other people. Don't care about the poor. Don't care about those with less than you. Enjoy your life and any, you know, all this stuff about spiritual things. Maybe it's true, maybe it's not. Who knows? Jesus says that's what happens when the thorns choke out the word. And then he talks to us about the good soil at the very end here. Verse 20, but those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. Notice what he says here to us. Dif the, the soil, the good soil, produces different amounts of fruit. Here's one of the things I think Jesus wants us to realize when he puts it like that. He wants us to be patient with those who aren't as far along as we might perceive ourselves to be. You know what strikes me again and again, y'all, is the patience of God with me and my failure to bear fruit. In my failure to follow him as I should. And he says there's going to be different degrees. Again, unequal distribution here. <laughs> some people will be hundredfold producers, some thirtyfold. That is not an excuse not to strive to be a hundredfold producer. It is to tell us be patient as your father is patient with you. He has a divine, tailored growth plan for everybody in here if you're a Christian. He has a plan of where he's taking you. And so Jesus tells us how to grow in fruit bearing. Look what he says there. Hear the word, accept it, and bear fruit. The word there for accept means to welcome it. As I was looking over these notes this morning, I was thinking to myself, the moment I stepped off the plane yesterday, and I'm not just trying to be a flatterer here, but I felt welcome. There was Pastor Quentin waiting at the airport, welcoming me in. Roger and Christine welcoming me in. Rod and Karen welcoming me in. And, and when you feel that, you go, this is how it should be. And Jesus says, I want your heart to be oriented like that towards the word. Hear it, welcome it, put it into practice. That's how he says you know you're a good soil hearer. Do you hear it? Do you welcome it? Are you striving to put it into practice? That is not salvation by works. Because as he's told us, the only person who hears is the one whom God has chosen and given it to. But it is a test of our faith. If you hear it and welcome it, what are you doing with it? That's what James means. Don't be hearers of the word only, but be doers. I think he's got this parable in mind. He is sitting here listening to it. I think James had that in mind when he wrote those verses. So the, only the plow of God's grace can make our hard hearts into fertile soil. And so the, the burning question here is this, as one, one scholar put it, all of us 
are becoming new every day. New into bad or new into good. You are moving closer to God every day or moving further away from him. There is no neutral ground. There's no way you're static in your life. Change is happening every day. The choices you make today are connected to yesterday's choices and are connected to tomorrow's choices. And there is a trajectory in your life. And Jesus says it's either one of the first three soils or it's the good soil. Which one will it be? That's the question. What's the direction of your life? Let me say a few things as we finish up here with this one. One of the things this parable shows us is the beauty of grace and the need for humility. Is grace beautiful to you? I love this church's story. Uh, Rod sent me the the link from Scott Clark's blog that that detailed what Pastor Stan and the elders have, have transitioned through. Just an amazing story here. Just the beauty of grace captured this church. Does it still capture your heart? As, as one, one author put it, the, the reason why Paul, one of the reasons why Paul did what he did in his missionary sufferings is, he put it this way, Paul never got over being saved. He never got over the beauty of grace. And I put that intentionally. It's so easy in confessional reform circles to be able to debate truth and not think it's beautiful. To be able to love the five points of Calvinism as a doctrinal system and not be overwhelmed by their beauty. Is it beautiful to you that God saves you by sheer grace? Does that cause you wonder? Like looking at the Siskiyou Mountains. I mean, that's normal everyday scenery for y'all. That is not normal. (laughs) It is so breathtakingly beautiful, I've almost wrecked the car twice just driving around. (laughs) That's when we hear this parable, when Jesus says, to you it's been given. That that statement should say, yes, I need to wonder at that again. That is like watching a sunset over the Siskiyous. It should cause overwhelming joy and should make things beautiful again to me about salvation. And therefore, that requires humility. And one of the hardest things for us to do whether in marriage, at work, on social media, is to admit we're wrong, to admit that we are not wise, to admit that we cannot figure it out. Have you come to that point in your life? Because if you haven't, it's going to be really, really hard, if not impossible, to believe the gospel. It's impossible apart from God's grace. And the way he starts doing that is to show you how needy you are, how much you don't get it. And that assaults our pride. That's one of the things Jesus was doing here. He did that constantly to the religious leaders. He said to them, you don't know. Yes, we do. We know more than you. Where did you train? What was the matter? Pride. We do know. And Jesus says, no, it's so easy to think you do and you don't. And that's what we see all around us today. People going, I'm cynical. I don't need this. I've got other spiritualities. I've got other worldviews, other philosophies. I don't need the quote-unquote wisdom you're offering me. But here's what Jesus says. I am the only farmer in human history who can make barren soil into fruit-bearing ground overnight. Change is available for immediate consumption today, as it were. Here's what Jesus is saying to you and to me. If you feel like an outsider... He says, if you feel like you're dried up spiritually, like you're a shell, like Jesus is a nice idea, but not a living person, if you feel like that, he says, the the surest way to know that God's grace is at work in your life is to take that to Jesus and say, help me. I don't want to be an outsider. I want to be an insider. And that, that is the paradox of the gospel, friends. It is simultaneously the most exclusive message in the world and the most inclusive message in the world. Truly inclusive. Not pagan inclusive. Inclusivity means today, I never challenge you on anything. Everything you do is right. And nobody can live like that, friends. The inclusivity of the gospel says this, all are welcome. Nobody's not a candidate, to use really bad grammar. (laughs) 
Everybody's a candidate for grace. Everyone's welcome to come. Inclusivity, exclusivity. Jesus is the only way. He's the only solution. He's the only one who can give you wisdom. In him, Paul says, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden. So it's simultaneously the most inclusive and exclusive message you can hear. Outsiders become insiders. Insiders become outsiders in God's gospel economy and dealings with us. So the question then is, which are you here this morning? Are you an outsider? Are you someone who has kept Jesus at arm's length safely away from your designer life and your autonomy, your self-will? That's what autonomy is, your own self-law. You say, I got it figured out. Or, or, maybe you're somebody who's going, I'm really intrigued by this and I want to know more. And let me say, there's a third category here. Maybe you're somebody who's walked with Jesus for a long time and you feel really worn out. In all three cases, he says, come to me. Don't you love that invitation of Matthew eleven twenty eight? 28? Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Weary and heavy laden. If that's how you feel this morning, here's what Jesus says. I want to make you bear fruit, not make you empty, not make you worn out, not make you more weary. I want to show you grace and take your burden. Come to me. He says, so here's, here's the choice. Keep going in your own strength, dried up, worn out, shell-like, living in a gray haze of dull, sullen despair. That's choice number one. That's the first three soils. And isn't that so descriptive of what we see around us? A culture in despair. Who was it? Was it Ralph Waldo Emerson, I think, in in Walden, who said, most men lead lives of quiet desperation. He wrote those words, what, 150 years ago, 160 years ago? And, And has anything changed today? Most people leading lives of quiet desperation. And those are all the first three soils. That's choice number one. And don't think it can't affect you if you're a believer. It can we, we are far more influenced by the culture around us than we ever care to admit. We buy into its values. We, it seeps into us. It's atmospheric. We breathe it in. And it can begin to affect us as Christians. We can begin to buy into the deception. And we can begin to feel like the world feels. See as the world sees. Hear as the world hears. And it subtly withers away our faith. That's choice one. Choice two is this. You can admit your need and come to Jesus and become fully human. Here's what we're going to cover here in just a few minutes in our next session. Jesus makes you fully human. That may be new. And, and where we get that from is because, it, where we get that from is the resurrection of Christ. It's not just a neat trick God did to say, here, you know, I can do miracles. If you ever read through the gospel, like, the miracles are secondary. Jesus goes to a blind man, lame man, hey, get up and walk. Now, pay attention to what I'm going to say. That was the easy thing for him. That makes perfect sense when you read the scriptures because Jesus is the creator. (laughs) He can do whatever he wants. He wants to make blind people see. He lame men walk. Yes, easy. Same thing with the resurrection. It's not the focus of the miracle itself. That is stupendous. But it's what it signifies about who Jesus is and what's coming to us. And it tells us he's the son of God, vindicated in the power of the spirit, as 2 Timothy says, Romans 1, 3 and 4. But it's also telling us about us, that he's at work to renew us. As Paul will say in 2 Corinthians, what is that, 4, Our outer man is wasting away day by day. Our inner man is being renewed. That's what he's up to. He says, come to me and I will make you the person you've always wanted to be. All of us want a good life, as it were. All of us want to be alive. We want to experience that. And the paradox of the gospel is the only way you get to do that is by giving up on you. 
The only thing that what Jesus promises you to be fully human, fully alive, the only thing it costs you is you. The only thing it costs you is a death to your way of doing life, to my way of doing life. And what Jesus promises in return is fruit bearing, is a life that reflects his glory, images his sufferings and resurrection, and makes us fully alive. Praise God. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for giving us time to study it here, Lord, how kind you are to set apart time in busy weeks for us to gather around your word, huddle around it, as it were. Feed us, speak to us, show us more as we continue our time together this morning. Thank you. Make us all hundredfold hearers here this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.